Hey, Mike here. I just wanted to let you know that you can listen to Dark Poutine early and ad-free on Amazon Music, included with Prime. Welcome back to Dark Poutine. I am Mike Brown, and this is Matthew Stockton. Hello, Mike Brown. How are you, Matthew Stockton? 10 out of 10. 10 out of 10. Wow, yeah, we're full of pizza, that's why. (laughs) I think I need a nap, man. Uncle Fatty's Pizza. Makes Matty Fatty. (laughs) Right? Oh, boy, it was good. And I'm going for Chinese food tonight, too. Nice. Oh, well, such goes the diet. But, you know, everybody's going to have a cheat day once in a while, I guess. It's true. You can diet tomorrow. There you go. The views, information, and opinions expressed during the Dark Poutine podcast are solely those of the producer and do not necessarily represent those of Curious Cast, its affiliate Global News, nor its parent company, Chorus Entertainment. Dark Poutine is not for the faint of heart or squeamish. Our content is often intense and some listeners may find it disturbing. We are not experts on the topics we present, nor are we journalists. We are ordinary Canadian schmucks chatting about crime and the dark side of history. Let's get to it. Put on your toque, grab yourself a double-double and a Nanaimo bar. It's time to scarf down some dark poutine. You are responsible for obtaining and maintaining at your own cost all equipment needed to listen to dark poutine. Dark poutine can be addictive. Side effects may include, but not be limited to, pausing and questioning the system, elevated heart rate, pondering humanity, odd looks from colleagues as you laugh out loud at work, family members not into true crime worrying about you. Positive side effects may include some perspectives and opinions that you disagree with, as well as some wokeness and empathy. If you don't think dark poutine is for you, consult your doctor immediately. On the morning of February 20th, 1989, stay-at-home mother of two, Janice Faye Johnson, was found unconscious, gravely injured, and barely clinging to life at the foot of a flight of basement stairs in the Shelburne, Nova Scotia home she shared with her family, husband Clayton Norman Johnson, and their two daughters, Darla and Dawn. Even though she was alive when she was found by a neighbor who called an ambulance immediately, Janice died in the hospital just after noon that day. More than three years after her death, police arrested Janice's husband, Clayton, a high school industrial arts teacher, and charged him with first-degree murder. Consistently maintaining his innocence throughout subsequent proceedings, on May 4, 1993, Clayton was found guilty of the first-degree murder of his wife, Janice. He was sentenced to life in prison. His appeals, citing spurious forensic evidence, were rejected, and he spent the next five years in prison. One would presume that was a sort of ending to the story, but it wasn't. This is Dark Poutine episode 258, The Tragic Tale of Janice and Clayton Johnson. Shelburne, Nova Scotia, where this story takes place, is a historic town on the south shore of Nova Scotia. It's just an hour and 15 minutes drive down Highway 103 from my hometown in Bridgewater. The town is situated on a natural harbor and was founded in 1783 by Loyalists who fled the United States after the American Revolution. The town quickly became a thriving center for shipbuilding, fishing, and trade, and by the early 19th century, it was one of the most important ports in Atlantic Canada. During the War of 1812, the town served as an important naval base for the British Royal Navy, and it continued to grow and prosper throughout the 19th century. In the early 20th century, The town's economy shifted from fishing and shipbuilding to forestry and manufacturing. However, like many small towns in Nova Scotia, Shelburne experienced a decline in population and economic activity in the latter half of the 20th century as young people left to seek opportunities in larger cities. Today, Shelburne is known for its well-preserved historic buildings and its role as a tourist destination. The town's waterfront, which includes several historic buildings and a marina, is a popular visitor spot. 
In addition, the town's museums and cultural institutions offer a glimpse into the history and culture of this unique and storied community. Yeah, I have this image of everyone living in these cute little wooden houses that are um, painted different colors in this town. The, that's actually close by. That's Lunenburg. Okay. So it's it's a little ways down the highway. Aren't you from Lunenburg? I grew up in Lunenburg County. Okay. So I am from Bridgewater. Oh, which yes, Bridgewater. Is, Bridgewater is the lesser known of the three little towns uh, of Mahone Bay. Because I haven't and, been to any of these provinces, so and all I ever see are the uh, yeah the, the, the really quaint images on tourist, you know, brochure sort of things. What am I, like 1865 <laughs> online? <laughs> I still feel like I need to move back there at some point. But yeah? Yeah. I don't know. Maybe one day. Don't leave me. The events on the morning that Janice was found were well documented in the subsequent police investigation. Janice Johnson had agreed to watch her three-year-old neighbor, Brittany Malloy, for the day. Janice had planned a fun outing, including taking Brittany to a local carnival. Janice's husband, Clayton, phoned their neighbor, Brittany's dad, Robert Malloy, at around 7 a.m. to let Robert know that Janice wanted him to drop off the toddler at least by 8 a.m. Ever helpful, Clayton packed lunches for his daughters, Darla and Dawn, and took dirty laundry down to the basement for Janice. He then went to do his daily Bible reading. After looking out her window and seeing Darla and Dawn Johnson, then 8 and 11 years old, climb onto the school bus at around 7.40 a.m., next-door neighbor Claire Thompson called to chat with Janice. They did that a lot. Sometime during their 10-minute phone conversation, Claire overheard Janice say goodbye to her husband, Clayton. Clayton later said that he kissed Janice goodbye and left for work. He was a well-liked industrial arts teacher at nearby Lockport High School, around a half-hour drive away. Clayton stopped for gas at a local gas station and continued on his way. Just over halfway to Lockport, Clayton's drive became much slower as he became stuck behind a school bus picking up students on their way to another school day. Claire and Janice's conversation ended at around 7.50 a.m. Only a minute after they hung up, Robert and little Brittany Malloy arrived at the Johnson place. They knocked and entered through the basement door. They quickly discovered something terrible. Malloy saw Janice Johnson lying unconscious at the foot of the basement stairs. So Clayton had left. Yeah. She hung up the phone, mm. and just almost a minute later, she was found at the bottom of stairs. Right. It's sounding pretty cut and dry to me that this was an accident. To me too, but I guess that... In a minute, things can go awry, I guess. She, That's what uh, maybe investigators... Alone. Yeah. Well, uh, I don't know. Was she alone? Yes. Okay. <laughs> I, I vote yes. <laughs> well, some investigators didn't think so, and we'll get there later. From the Globe and Mail, quote, They found Mrs. Johnson lying at the bottom of the wooden basement stairs in a pool of blood. Mr. Malloy rushed to the Thompson home and called an ambulance at 754. Mrs. Johnson lay struggling for breath, bleeding profusely, one foot resting on the bottom step, still holding her car keys she'd evidently been preparing to leave the house. Ambulance attendants tried desperately to stabilize her condition, tossing blood-soaked equipment about the basement as they worked, end quote. The school had already been notified that Janice had been injured and rushed to the hospital before Clayton's arrival there. Clayton Johnson was met by the school secretary when he got to work at 8.11 a.m. She told him what had happened and that Clayton was supposed to go to the hospital right away, which he did. According to witnesses, Clayton was visibly distraught as a medical team worked in vain to save his wife. She died at 12.04 p.m., just over four hours after Malloy and his daughter discovered her. After she'd passed away, Clayton spent 15 minutes alone with Janice's body. He later testified that he just held her hand, and kept saying over and over, Why God? Murder, if one were at all committed, would have had to have taken place within an improbable, almost impossible timeline. From the Globe and Mail, quote, At the suggestion of their evangelical pastor, two friends of Mrs. Johnson, Mary Hartley and Mary Davis, went from the hospital to the Johnson home to clean up most of the blood. Meanwhile, Mr. Johnson broke the news to his daughters. The family then moved in with Mrs. Johnson's parents for several weeks. Nova Scotia's chief coroner, Roland Perry, had little problem concluding that Mrs. Johnson had accidentally fallen forward as she went down the stairs. 
He deduced that her head had wedged briefly in a 14-centimeter gap between the stairs and the wall before she flipped over and came to a stop, end quote. It appeared that Janice Johnson had died as the result of a freak accident. Perry's report, dated April 26, 1989, indicated that Janice had somehow tripped and fallen down the stairs head first. Her skull was badly crushed on both sides, most likely caused by smashing hard into the stairs, the concrete wall, and the basement's concrete floor. 36-year-old Janice Faye Johnson, born Cotter, was buried in the Harbor Light Pentecostal Cemetery in East Green Harbor, Shelburne County. It didn't take long before the gossip hotline in the small community of about 3,000 was flaming with nasty speculations. By the summer of that year, rumors had spread around the town pointing at Janice's grieving husband, Clayton, as having killed his wife for insurance money. Worse yet, in the opinion of local busybodies, was that Clayton, 44, had taken up with a woman half his age, 22-year-old Tina Waybrett, three months after Janice had died. As someone who's lived in a small town, I can verify this kind of ugly talk after a tragedy is pretty common. Clayton, a regular churchgoer, had met Tina, a member of the Pentecostal congregation to which he belonged. She comforted him and fell in love with Clayton and his girls. She would later say that Clayton had been concerned that alone he'd be unable to provide an adequate environment for the girls to grow. He felt they needed a woman's influence, and Tina was willing to provide that. The couple was married a year after they'd begun dating. The nuptials sent the curtain-twitching busybodies in Shelburne into a frenzy. So these people have nothing better to do but use gossip as a tool to distract themselves from the fact that they feel jealous of a man who's just able to pick up his life and pick up his piece, the pieces of his life and get on with it, right? It's kind of a common thing in small towns. And I think the fact that she was half his age, yeah, people freak out about that all the time for some reason. Yeah. I don't know. Yeah, I have I have friends who there's like a forty year age difference between them, mm -hmm. um, man and a woman, right? And tongues are wagging when that happened. Sure, but I know them both as close friends, right? And there's they're a perfect couple, yeah, right? But everyone's like, oh, mail order bride is not that at all. Mm -hmm. What juicy gossip Clayton and Tina's wedding made, and so soon after Janice had died. People whispered that perhaps Clayton had been having an affair with Tina prior to Janice's death and had killed his wife to pursue a life with Tina, a younger woman. Clayton's insurance settlement due after Janice passed away was the cherry on top of the unseemly Sunday. A local RCMP corporal, Brian Oldford, got wind of the chatter around town and reopened the investigation into Janice's death. He discovered the recently acquired insurance policy had paid Clayton $125,000. That, coupled with a new relationship so soon after Janice had died, added up to quite a viable motive for murder. Oldford set to work over the next few months, meticulously going over every bit of evidence he could find concerning Janice Johnson's death. He wanted to be sure that someone had not gotten away with murder. Oldford seemed to have a bee in his bonnet, according to the Johnson family, and many others who felt it impossible that Clayton Johnson was a murderer. The RCMP corporal was hyper-focused on Clayton Johnson, questioning people repeatedly and even going so far at one point to show Tina, Clayton's new wife, photos of Janice Johnson's autopsy and telling her she'd most likely be Clayton's next victim. That's a horrible thing to do. It's a shitty thing to do. And, okay, so... I get it if, if you're thinking maybe he's a murderer. Yeah, but, I, you know, you want police to be thorough, mm -hmm. right? And do the best they can. But I can imagine that if you... Start becoming obsessive about it. Yeah. I mean, I do this with some of the work that I do, Mike. Sure. I become obsessed with something and I go into these rabbit holes. Oh, I'm not known for that at all. <laughs> but, you know, somebody's life isn't on the line with my work. Right. right, yeah. As what might have been a crime scene had been cleaned up by the two helpful family friends so soon after Janice's death, Oldford interviewed the two women who'd completed it, Mrs. Hartley and Mrs. Davis. Their initial statements to police indicated that there had been blood on the floor only around Janice's head where she'd come to rest. However, during Oldford's interview, almost two years later, they were claiming there had been blood spatters in other places around the basement. Although first responders, police and paramedics, had not taken note of these, perhaps as the women had spent more time in the basement cleaning, they'd noticed something initially missed. 
RCMP brought in an analyst who used a tool that detects very small traces of blood and tested areas of the basement, as indicated by Mrs. Hartley and Mrs. Davis. But the tests turned up nothing. This didn't seem to lead Oldford away from the theory of murder, as Janice's fall had taken place over two years ago. There had been a long time to clean up the basement further, even since the thorough cleaning job that was done by the two women initially. From a Globe and Mail article, quote, Armed with this new evidence suggesting a struggle, Sergeant Oldford sought opinions from two outside pathologists, Charles Hutton of St. John's and David King of Hamilton, on the basis of the purported bloodstains, both felt murder was a likely scenario. They visualized Mrs. Johnson being felled with a two-by-four, trapping her head between the stairs and wall, and then receiving several more blows as she laid on the floor. Informed by Sergeant Oldford of their conclusions, the coroner, Dr. Perry, changed his stance in favor of a murder theory. The Fifth Estate, a CBC documentary series, later confirmed in the interviews that Dr. King and Dr. Hutton were not shown reports by RCMP forensic analysts that warned it would be dangerous to draw conclusions from the purported blood spatters, end quote. Perhaps the reason for not showing the doctors that report was because it might have changed their opinions on what happened to Janice on the day she died. Regardless, with the opinions of the two experts in hand, supporting the other purely circumstantial evidence in the case, Oldford, his superiors, and the Crown felt they had enough to arrest and charge Clayton Johnson. In April of 1992, Clayton Norman Johnson, a respected teacher and by all accounts a loving husband and father, was arrested and charged with the first-degree murder of Janice Faye Johnson. Clayton Johnson claimed that Oldford had ulterior motives for charging him. According to an article in the Globe and Mail, quote, There is a promotion in this, and you're my ticket, Mr. Johnson quoted Oldford, telling him. The officer, who was later promoted to the rank of sergeant, said he thought it unlikely he would say such a thing. Quote, if I made that statement, it would be very Mickey Mouse, and I don't think I would say that, end quote. Clayton declined a deal, reducing the charge to manslaughter, were he only to plead guilty to that lesser charge. Clayton denied having anything to do with Janice's death and didn't want any part of it. He pleaded not guilty and was set to be tried by a jury of his peers in May of 1993 in Nova Scotia Supreme Court before Justice Jamie Saunders in Shelburne. More after a quick break. Hey, it's Kaylee Cuoco for Priceline. Ready to go to your happy place for a happy price? Well, why didn't you say so? Just download the Priceline app right now and save up to 60% on hotels. So whether it's Cousin Kevin's Kazoo concert in Kansas City, go Kevin! Or Becky's Bachelorette Bash in Bermuda, you never have to miss a trip ever again. So download the Priceline app today. Your savings are waiting. Go to your happy place for a happy price. Go to your happy price, Priceline. If you're looking for a smoking gun, I can absolutely guarantee you, you will not find it. In October 2001, a series of letters filled with a deadly powder called anthrax were dropped into the U.S. mail system. What started as an unprecedented case turned into an unsettling mystery. Who sent these deadly letters and why? From Campside Media and Sony Music Entertainment, I'm Josh Dean, and this is Cover Up Season 4, The Anthrax Threat. Available now. And we are back. Matthew, what are your thoughts so far? I, I, I'm still stuck on the fact that he was clearly gone when it happened. Yeah. That he just called the neighbor uh, to ensure that the neighbor dropped off the kid on time. Yeah. Yeah. Why would you want somebody? Right. Like, hey, hey, make sure, you know. Come discover my murder. And that is essentially idle gossip that, and, and an overzealous copper yeah. that created a fake case that shouldn't have been created. Right. I feel so bad for this guy. So he lived through the death of his wife, who he clearly loved. Yeah. You look at him, he looks like a Clayton, like. Right, he he did. <laughs> he, he, yeah. he looked like a Clayton, yeah. right? And you see a picture with him and his wife, and they look like a lovely couple. Mm -hmm. And and he's gone through all of that, and like, what now does he have to go through? 
Famed Nova Scotia defense attorney Joel Pink represented Clayton Johnson. And we've mentioned Mr. Pink in several episodes. He was involved in the trial of the Sydney River McDonald's murderers and defended Christopher Garnier after the murder of Halifax police officer Catherine Campbell. Both have been covered in past episodes of Dark Poutine. Although unsuccessful in both of those cases, Pink is known to be one of the most experienced and successful homegrown defense attorneys in Nova Scotia. He went to University of Dalhousie for his law degree. So mm, Swank. Yeah, well, it is a good law school. It is. Yeah. Did you know him? I didn't know him, nor did I require his I figure, services. I figure everyone in the on the East Coast knows each other. Well, we do know of each other. You, you probably you probably like one degree of separation from him, aren't you? Oh, I wouldn't doubt it. Yeah, I wouldn't doubt that. Yeah. Um, he's a very famous attorney in Nova Scotia, and like I say, he's been involved in all those high profile cases. He's an interesting cat. Yeah, yeah, mm. for sure. During Clayton's trial. The Crown claimed that he had murdered Janice to gain her life insurance policy and pursue a romantic relationship with Tina. Despite a complete lack of evidence linking Clayton and Tina before Janice's death, the Crown insisted that they were involved. To support their argument that Clayton had killed Janice, the Crown presented forensic, quote-unquote, evidence from Dr. King and Dr. Hutton, which was the centerpiece of their case. To further sway the jury, the prosecution used baseless and wildly speculative evidence, such as Clayton's crying or lack thereof, his failure to overtake a school bus on the highway, and his five-minute tardiness to school to suggest supposed murderous intent and guilty conscience. So it's that old thing where if they don't cry or if they do cry mm. or if they, you know, say whatever they say, they're guilty. Everyone acts differently. Though, totally. Right? And... Mm -hmm. and this whole like five minutes late. I mean, the timing of everything is just so tight in this. It's really razor and, thin. And they're really like, okay, it was one minute here and it was five minutes there, right? Mm -hmm. It's like, come on. And I don't know about you, but when I'm behind a school bus, I'm extra careful because, you know, those little critters run out in front of you. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> right. And, and like, I totally slow down. And he's a teacher. Yeah, so. He's not going to be one of those people who speed past a school no, bus. No, he knows the rugrats are out there. Like, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> he's actually concerned. Clayton testified on his own behalf, feeling he had nothing to hide. As he said, he was innocent. From InnocenceCanada.com, quote, Clayton staunchly maintained that he was innocent, as he had done ever since his arrest. He told the jury that, quote, I had nothing to do whatsoever with the injuries caused to Jan. I loved her too much, as I love my two girls. I just don't know how the injuries occurred. I know I didn't. Let God be my witness. I had nothing to do with it whatsoever, end quote. The article continues. On May 4th, 1993, Clayton was found guilty of first-degree murder of his wife. After the jury returned this verdict, the trial judge asked Clayton if he had anything to say. His response was simply, no, other than I didn't do it, and I am innocent. That's all I can say, end quote. Clayton was incarcerated for the next five years at the Atlantic Institution in Renew, New Brunswick. An appeal of his conviction was dismissed in March of 1994 by the Nova Scotia Court of Appeal, and an appeal to take the matter to a higher court, known in Canada as an appeal for leave, was denied in 1995 by the Supreme Court of Canada. Effectively, if there is a denial of an appeal for leave, the higher court is stating that the lower court dealt with the matter appropriately. Imagine the punch in the gut it would be every time your appeal, appeal was rejected if you're innocent. I can't. Right? It, you'd be in this n total nightmare. Scenario. You have your hopes up and then... Bleh. And you're like, well, why can't you see this? Why can't you see that I'm absolutely innocent? Yeah. Right? Clayton contacted Innocence Canada, formerly AIDWYC, in November of 1995. The organization reviewed Clayton's case and decided to take it on. From the Innocence Canada website article on Clayton Johnson's case, quote, With Innocence Canada's help, Clayton submitted an application for the ministerial review of his conviction under Section 690, now Section 696.1, of the Criminal Code. This application was granted and Innocence Canada prepared a wide variety of material for the Minister of Justice which demonstrated that Clayton had been wrongly convicted, end quote. Section 696.1 of the Criminal Code has been created for people just like Clayton, quote, whose rights of judicial review or appeal with respect to the conviction or finding have been exhausted, 
so they can appeal to the federal justice minister if evidence strongly points to a miscarriage of justice. Innocence Canada was determined to uncover the truth about what had really happened to cause Janice's death. Was it a homicide or merely an unfortunate accident? The evidence leaned toward accident. Consulting with experts who had access to all the evidence, especially that of the supposed blood spatter, Innocence Canada sought to refute the flawed forensic pathology evidence presented by Dr. King and Dr. Hutton. Innocence Canada raised serious concerns about the reliability of the evidence provided by Mary Hartley and Mary Davis in relation to the observations they claimed to have made. The credibility of their accounts was found to be questionable at best. No one was saying they were liars, only that their accounts had changed over time to fit the narrative of murder now being presented. The investigation revealed that Mary Hartley was interviewed 19 months after Janice's death, and the officer's notes showed that she was unsure of her recollections. While Mary initially believed that Janice had fallen down the stairs, she later revised her theory after seeing the photo of Janice's head injury. Mary explained that she had taken one of the photos from its file when the officers were out of the room and concluded that her original theory, quote, couldn't have happened. In other words, she had altered her memory to fit the evidence in the file. Right. I don't think she's vindictive or anything here. I actually think, you know, if you're not a forensic specialist mm -hmm. and you see a gruesome photograph, yep. one that you can't believe what would ha that would happen because of an accident, mm -hmm. because in fact, you know, we don't see a lot of these photos and actually accidents can be very messy and gory. Yeah. Right. And if you're not used to that and you're not a forensic expert, Maybe in her head, she's like, oh, I, I have to be wrong, and I don't want somebody to get away with murder. I have heard stories about this kind of thing happening. Like, this witness should not have been able to see that. No. But the interesting thing about that is that I have heard stories in true crime, in drama, and all that kind of thing, where I'm, and I'm not suggesting that this is what happened. Right. This is just a, a weird theory of mine okay. of how she came to see this. Sometimes an officer wanting to sway things will say, hey, I'm going to leave the room for a while, but this file is here. With, with, with the picture slightly sticking out of the file. Or, or right? even that, or just even the, not just, saying Just it. the edge. <laughs> yeah. And then coming back and saying, so what do you think now? I was wondering if maybe that's what happened while you were reading that. Yeah. Uh, I'm, we're not saying it did or didn't. Right. But, but uh, it's... It's, it's, it was, it's been a thing that has happened. Smells like a fish. The revelations were a turning point in Clayton's case, exposing the weaknesses and inconsistencies in the prosecution's case and giving Clayton a chance to clear his name finally. It was a momentous moment in the quest for justice and a triumph for those who had tirelessly worked to uncover the truth. Mary Davis was interviewed by Oldford a day after Mary Hartley, and her new statement starkly contrasted with her original one. This time, Mary recalled observing a significant amount of blood in different locations, which was a marked deviation from her previous statement. It is not clear why the two women were not interviewed on the same day and separately, so discrepancies could have been uncovered. Time had elapsed between the two interviews, and the two friends may have talked innocently about Mrs. Hartley's interview prior to Miss Davis's the next day. So, basic rules. This is like what you don't do. This is actually, yeah. <laughs> you know what I mean? It, it's like, like let, policing one on one. Let, let's let them talk and then, and you know, get the, get a story straight between the two and then interview the other one again. Right? But if it fits the narrative that you're trying to build. But that is bad investigative work. Uh, it's something. The life insurance motive was easily explainable too. Clayton was one of 40% of Nova Scotia teachers who'd taken the opportunity to acquire life insurance policies for both he and Janice through the Nova Scotia Teachers Union. At the suggestion of a union representative, Clayton, who worked in dangerous construction jobs alongside his teaching job, decided to purchase a life insurance policy. He wanted to ensure that his family, particularly his wife and daughters, would be provided for in case something untoward happened to him. It was proven that the relationship between Clayton and Tina had started after Janice's death and not before. Tina had provided emotional support for Clayton and the girls, whom Tina adopted as her own. 
The girls and Tina continued to support Clayton, believing in his innocence, even after his conviction. Prison, though, was too much of a strain on the couple, and sometime after Clayton's conviction, they separated and divorced. From the Globe and Mail, quote, Mr. Johnson's extended family remained highly supportive. My mom would be angry with all these people, her friends, who turned against my dad, his daughter Darla said. She would hate them for this. Ms. Waybrett has since moved from Nova Scotia and remarried. After two years of traveling to Mr. Johnson's remote prison in Renew, she lost hope of his ever being released. She said, I got tired of saying goodbye all the time. She said, I had lost faith in the justice system. I have always been 100% certain he didn't do it, but I felt no matter what we did, we were going to lose, end quote. From Innocence Canada, quote, on September 21, 1998, the Minister of Justice sent Clayton's case back to the Nova Scotia Court of Appeal, requiring the court to reopen it. On September 25, Clayton was finally released from prison after spending five years behind bar for a crime that never occurred. End quote. In, February of in February of 2002, on a NovaScotia.ca press release, the Crown indicated their intention to drop the matter. The release said, quote, Public Prosecution Service, Crown Halts Clayton Johnson Murder Prosecution. The Public Prosecution Service today asked the Supreme Court of Nova Scotia to acquit Clayton Johnson on a conviction for murder. The Shelburne man was convicted in 1993 of murdering his wife. Janice Johnson was found at the bottom of the basement stairs with severe head injuries on February 20, 1989. Mr. Johnson was sentenced to 25 years in prison before being eligible for parole. Having exhausted all avenues of appeal, including a denial of leave to appeal at the Supreme Court of Canada, Mr. Johnson served five years in prison before filing an application for release with the Federal Minister of Justice under Section 690 of the Criminal Code. The Nova Scotia Court of Appeal ordered Mr. Johnson's release while awaiting arguments from both the Crown and Defence. Meanwhile, opinions were solicited from 22 experts in forensic pathology, engineering, biomechanics, physics, and human postural dynamics. The experts focused on what caused Mrs. Johnson's fatal injuries. The opinions of 14 forensic pathologists on the case of Mrs. Johnson's injuries ranged from accidental to likely accidental to favoring accidental to uncertainty whether they were accidental or as the result of an assault to caused by an assault. The majority of opinions do not favor assault. The broad range of expert opinions within the totality of the evidence means that murder cannot be proven beyond a reasonable doubt, said Martin Hershorn, Director of Public Prosecutions. Therefore, there is no realistic prospect of conviction, and we cannot undertake retrial. The Crown notified the defense and the Court of Appeal of its decision last week. The Crown and the defense asked the Court of Appeal this morning to quash Mr. Johnson's original conviction and order a new trial. After arrangement and plea before a Supreme Court justice this afternoon, the Crown offered no evidence and asked the court to order an acquittal for Mr. Johnson. We made this decision only after intense scrutiny of the evidence and concluded that proof of murder beyond a reasonable doubt was not attainable, said Mr. Hershorn. Once we reached that decision, we had an obligation to both the accused and to the public to stop the prosecutorial process. Mr. Hershorn emphasized that the role of the Crown in any criminal matter is to assess the evidence and make a decision to move forward with prosecution only if there is a realistic prospect of conviction. In this way, the rights of both the accused and the public at large are protected, he said. End quote. Clayton Johnson sued for wrongful prosecution. On June 18, 2004, Another NovaScotia.ca press release came indicating that the matter had been settled. It read, quote, Justice Minister Michael Baker announced today, June 18, that the province has reached a successful conclusion to negotiations with Clayton Johnson of Shelburne. The payment covers legal fees, other expenses, and compensation for a total amount of $2.5 million. I'm pleased that we have been able to reach an amicable settlement, said Mr. Baker. This is a fair agreement, end quote. The monetary award, though significant, would not give missed time together back to Clayton and his daughters, who were preteens at the time of Janice's death. I bet some people are like, oh, lucky guy got two and a half million bucks. Yeah. But 
if you think about that, Mike, it's it's not a lot of money when you think of the trauma and the lost time with his kids, right? And no. the death of his wife. Totally. And I bet you he'd give twice that amount back f for all of this to have never happened and to, and to have his wife back, right? Oh, no doubt about it. Yeah. No doubt. After everything was settled, Clayton Johnson reconnected with his daughters and tried to rebuild his life. He started working for a time as a construction contractor, but sadly, Clayton passed away on September 20th, 2017 after an unspecified illness. He was a month away from his 72nd birthday. I found Clayton's obituary on Huskelson.net, the website for H.M. Huskelson's Funeral Homes and Crematorium Limited. Quote, Johnson, Clayton Norman of Barrington, passed away peacefully in Roseway Hospital with his daughters by his side on Wednesday, September 20th, 2017 at the age of 71. Clayton was born on October 14, 1945 at Bruce's nursing home in Shelburne. He was a kind, generous, and compassionate man who had a deep faith in God. In his early career, he taught industrial arts at Lockport Regional High School. Prior to his retirement, he ran a successful contracting business. He had a passion for woodworking and carpentry. Clayton enjoyed spending time with family and friends, sharing laughs, playing cards, or board games as well as watching baseball. He was a loving son, brother, husband, father, grandfather, uncle, and friend who will be dearly missed by everyone who knew him. People from all over who had become familiar with Clayton's wrongful conviction via media coverage signed the online guest book at huskelson.net. Tanya Spivey of Dalton, Illinois, wrote in part, quote, I've seen similar stories like that of Mr. Johnson. However, his particular situation broke my heart. Seeing him wipe his eyes with a blue handkerchief caused tears of my own. It was evident, even to a stranger and on television, that Clayton Johnson was a gentle soul incapable of such a crime. End quote. Many of the condolences, though, were from friends, family, and Clayton's former students. Tony Strobridge, living in Moose Jaw, Saskatchewan at the time of Clayton's passing, wrote, quote, My favorite teacher in Lockport, and no matter who turned against you in the dark times, I still said hello and never turned my back on you out of the respect you gained from a disrespectful, troubled teen. I hated everything and almost everyone, but you had my respect. All is forgiven. Mr. Johnson, I hope you found peace in loving arms. Oh, and that made me tear up a bit. Yeah, it's... it's... Do, you, do you remember the teachers that changed your life, the ones that actually cared? There was a number of them. One was my English teacher, Anne Stockdale. She really there, took me... It's often the English teacher. She took one, me under her one wing. One was mine as well. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, another was the phys ed teacher, yeah. Mr. Wynott. He knew I was a troubled guy. Mr. Why not? Yeah. Well, that's a that's a very actually common name in Lincoln County. I know, County. But, but it makes me happy whenever I hear it. <laughs> anyway, so Jim Why not was a really good egg, and he he took me under his wing, and he 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 asked me questions about what I had, was up to, right. and I lied to him. Oh. And when he found out I lied to him, it really hurt him. Oh. And and I've always kind of felt like, oh man, you know, he was really trying to be. Yeah. You know, he was trying to help me. Yep. Yeah. Anyway. So there are a lot of great teachers out there. There are. There were more condolences for Clayton. Ron Dalton of St. John's, Newfoundland wrote in part, quote, I knew Clayton well during his most difficult years as we shared unfortunate circumstances. I can truly say I never heard him speak a word in anger despite the frustrations we shared during those years. He was well respected by all who knew him and always demonstrated a strong faith and love for his family. His positive attitude served as an inspiration to many, myself included. End quote. Clayton was buried beside Janice in their family plot, his name above hers on their shared headstone. Now, for those who are familiar with this case, no doubt it stands out as reminiscent of the subsequent events surrounding the 2001 death of Kathleen Peterson in Durham, North Carolina. She, like Janice Johnson, was found at the bottom of a staircase in her home. Kathleen's husband, Michael Peterson, a novelist and former journalist, was charged with allegedly murdering his wife. The case became famous during the high-profile criminal trial. In addition, this case was the subject of a highly viewed Netflix documentary series, The Staircase, 
released in 2004, and updated with a second season in 2018. During Michael Peterson's trial, the prosecution argued that Peterson beat his wife to death with a blow poke, a long metal rod used to stoke fires, and staged the scene to make it look like she'd fallen down the stairs. The defense argued that Kathleen fell down the stairs accidentally and died due to her injuries. Peterson was found guilty of murder and sentenced to life in prison without the possibility of parole. However, the verdict was later overturned when it was discovered that one of the prosecution's key witnesses, blood spatter analyst Dwayne Deaver, had provided misleading testimony and was not the expert he claimed to be. In 2017, Peterson entered an Alford plea to the reduced charge of manslaughter, which allowed him to maintain his innocence while acknowledging that the prosecution had enough evidence to convict him. As a result, he was released from prison and sentenced to time already served. That case remains controversial and has been the subject of much public debate and speculation, which include a theory that a wild owl was responsible for the bloody injuries to Kathleen Peterson on the night of her death. Michael Peterson has written a book about the case, and there's been an HBO miniseries starring Colin Firth and Tony Collette as Michael and Kathleen. If you want to learn more about Clayton's case, click some of the links in our show notes, and they include a documentary done by the Fifth Estate, which is excellent. And that's it for Dark Routine episode 258, The Tragic Tale of Janice and Clayton Johnson. That's right, it's time for voicemails. You can leave us a message at 1-877-327-5786 or one 877 darkptn We'd love to hear from you. Let's see who called us this week. All right. Voicemail time. Uh, let's see. We've had quite a few because we haven't recorded for two weeks because we were uh, snowed out last Mike, week. Mike lost his power last week. Yeah, I didn't have any power. I, uh, lack of power was my dilemma. So I was like, do you have like a crank thing for your computer? No. <laughs> yeah. And plus, I didn't want you driving in that because it no, was like it was, 30 centimeters of snow. It was horrible. Yeah. So anyway, we're just recording two in one day, which is amazing. I love doing that. But anyway, let's move on to these voicemails. Here we are with the first one. Let's listen. Hi. I've been a long time listener first time caller as many have been but I just really felt like calling you guys to thank you for the Amanda Todd episode especially just because that's something that I feel like not too many people really understand how common things like that have been especially for girls in my generation. I'm 21 and I honestly cannot, not to her extent, but I cannot think of a single female I personally know who hasn't been a victim of online predators, especially from older men due to kick and illegal and all those types of sites. And it's just, so refreshing to hear, especially from males, someone acknowledge something like that and the impact it's had. And it breaks my heart that she felt that was the only way out. But I'm glad that there are people like you out there spreading this message. And I just can't thank you enough for everything that you guys do. I love you both. Have a great day. Thank you again. Thank you. And uh, this caller called in a second time uh, with a more personal voicemail that um, I've decided I'm not going to play. Okay. But uh, she, Matthew and I listened to it and it, it's, it was really moving. She thanked me for sharing my own experience and, and related some of hers. So, uh, And you have our love and support. uh, Totally. Yeah. I could hear a lot of emotion in her voice and she sounds like somebody. (laughs) You can see that you saw it on my face. Yeah. And she's been through a lot of stuff, it sounds like. And you know what? You're loved. You are loved. Uh, Come on, hang out in the Yumber Yard with us on Facebook (laughs) and learn about Steve the Bulldog and... (laughs) And everybody else asking weird questions like, what's an Nanaimo bar? I don't know how many times we get that question. All the time. Yeah, it's 
why I did the show primer and maybe I need to do another primer on the website that I could just post and <laughs> point people maybe to. You do. Yeah. yeah. And what she said about Amanda Todd, mm -hmm. that one was really super hard to do for me too. Um, yeah. Because you just want to go back in time and save her. Right. <laughs> you know? Yeah. But you know, that's not going to happen. No. But I still fantasize about it. Yeah. So let's uh, listen to our next voicemail. We've got four this week. So here's another. Hey guys, it's Tori calling. Um, today I've become a Patreon and I'm so excited uh, to be able to support you guys. Um, thank you for always being um, around and putting on such an amazing podcast. Um, I look forward to finding out what I do for a living. Um, that's probably the part that I'm the very most excited about. <laughs> anyway, keep doing what you're doing and go take a shit in your hat. Well, thank you, Tori. And uh, yeah, I guess we don't have to mention her in Patreon shout outs, but we will do it sort of a little out of sync here. I, so, I think Tori, yeah? with a name like Tori, yeah. I have to say that she's a member of parliament for the Green Party. <laughs> so, but where does she live first? <laughs> she, lives, she lives in Nanaimo. Oh, she lives in Nanaimo, yeah. the home of the bar. Yeah. And, uh, and with a name like Tory, I, wa I really want to give her a, a job as a politician in like the opposite of the Tory party. In, oh. in the Green party. <laughs> well, there you go. <laughs> yeah. She's, she's not a member of PP's no. party. No. So she's, she does lots of green initiatives. Oh, there you go. Yeah. There she, you go. She saves rainforests and parks and stuff like Good that. Good for you, Tory. Um, but Tori, I have to say, I tried to participate in recycling a cut few weeks back. <laughs> Matthew has real problems with recycling. And I kicked a cardboard box to collapse it. And yep. the doctor thinks I have fractured my foot. So Mas Matthew has a hairline fracture in his foot because he was trying <laughs> I tried to recycle. To recycle. <laughs> oh, man. Anyway. Thanks for your patronage. <laughs> yes, we appreciate it. <laughs> and thank you for your voicemail. Absolutely. Uh, next up, let's listen to this one. Hello, uh, my name is Anna. I'm calling from Vancouver. Um, and I have been meaning to call and leave a message for some time now as I've been a listener and I've caught up to all the episodes you've ever had. Um, but never really got a chance, and I just finished listening to your most recent episode of The Murder of Natsumi Kogawa, and um, was intrigued by a few comments that Matthew made regarding uh, Miku. So my husband's the GM there, and he's been there since 2017, so I thought it'd be funny for you to know that one of your regular listeners has a connection to the restaurant, and... Funny enough, my husband uh, thinks that I spend my days plotting his murder because all I do is listen to true crime. Um, so, yeah, just wanted to say that. And, um, yeah, I really do feel for the family. I am actually of Japanese background, and I was living in Japan at the time of the murder, and I actually moved back to Canada in 2017. Um, but I do remember reading about it and how awful it was, and I totally understand what Matthew was saying about how you feel like you just want to apologize on behalf of Canada for something so terrible happening to uh, Natsumi when all she was doing was just living her life in a foreign country and it was supposed to be, you know, memorable. Um, so it totally sucks how it went down, and it is not representative of most Canadians, but for sure I, I do also feel that need to apologize to the family for what happened to them even though you know we aren't at fault for it um yes yeah, just wanted to say hi and if you ever want to discuss true crime over sushi at miku let me know <laughs> hi <laughs> so yeah yeah that sounds good actually <laughs> i was actually in miku's sister restaurant manami last weekend last weekend yep. and we're planning on going to manami again in at the end of the month right is that correct is that where we're gonna go anytime you want to go anywhere i'm up for miku or manami okay maybe we should go to miku that would be fun let's do it yeah um thanks, i i thanks, think Ella. i've been there a long time ago can but... i give i think anna's a romance novelist is she yeah okay you can give names to the voicemail i know i felt like it or um, she said give jobs anna and i'm like i bet she's a romance novelist Hopefully she's not involved in Anna in the Apocalypse because I loathe that movie. 
loathed it. I didn't see it. Do, good. <laughs> Some people will say, Mike, it was great. It was lovely. And it was like <laughs> weird. And no, I hated it. I hated okay. every second of that movie. I'm going to watch it now. Okay. Yeah, you'll probably like it. <laughs> <laughs> And it's not a, it's not me saying that you have terrible taste. It's just you have different tastes than me. Your taste is quite wide, though. I am very eclectic yeah. when it comes to my my well. And remember cultural when we, taste. When, remember when we went down to like meet some people in that suburban in shopping mall in yeah. Seattle, and mm -hmm. we were listening to music, and I played mine, you played yours, and we could generally sing all of the songs together. Yes, right, <laughs> totally. <laughs> Well, let's listen to our last voicemail. Uh, yeah, interesting. Where's this one from? I'm curious. Hi, Mike and Matthew. My name is Heidi. I'm from Ontario, and I just wanted to say I'm a big fan of the podcast. I found you guys from an ad from another uh, true crime podcast I was listening to, and uh, Mike's voice honestly sounded so much like my dad's voice. Um, my dad is from Halifax and uh, I don't get to talk to him on the phone as much as I'd like because of our schedules. And so sometimes when I listen to your podcast, I feel like I'm listening to my dad. So uh, I wanted to thank you for that little bit of comfort you bring me. And also I find Matthew's voice very soothing as well. I often find myself falling asleep listening to your podcast, which is maybe not the healthiest thing for me psychologically, but <laughs> Uh, it seems to help. Um, I wanted to thank you again for um, providing great content and being able to handle these stories so respectfully. Um, it has meant a lot to me to hear more local cases in Canada. Um, I am always more curious to know about things that go on near me and as you've said in previous podcasts there's a lot of crime in southern ontario um it can be both comforting to know about it and a little scary to know about how much there is but i wanted to thank you both and uh go shit in your hats bye thanks heidi thanks heidi yeah, yeah. that was nice i'm i'm writing an episode right now that's not from southern ontario oh there yeah but Heidi just reminded me that there's a treasure trove of, of our own old stomping ground there totally is yeah you're right um and i'm so glad that i sound like your dad but uh you know when somebody says oh you remind me of my dad or my uncle or something like that i always think i'm an old man now i usually get you remind me of your my great aunt <laughs> That isn't a surprise. <laughs> oh, my. Wasn't there a uh, Mr. Dress-Up character named Aunt Bird? Yeah, I think there was. This It was like a bird puppet. Okay. And her name was Aunt Bird. Do you remember that? I remember yeah. it. Anyway, you, know, you know I have two aunts that listen to this show. Really? Yep. Well, that's nice. One in Edmonton and one in Ontario. I think I have two mothers who don't listen to the show. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway. <laughs> hi Aunt Anne, hi Aunt Sharon. <laughs> yeah. No, I'm pretty sure Diane will listen. I don't know if uh, mom does because the content is like a little rough. Miss, Mrs. Brown, if, <laughs> if you listen. <laughs> yeah. Mike's not going to talk to you about this. If you listen, call in next week. Oh my gosh, that would be funny. Yeah. That would be funny for my parents to call. I bet she, she doesn't listen. <laughs> no. <laughs> No, we won't get a call from them. <laughs> anyway, that's it for voicemails. That's it for this week's voicemails. Again, you can leave us one at one 327 5786 or one 877 We'd love to hear from you, even if it is just to say hi and to tell us to go shit in our hats. If you're stumped for what to chat with us about, a quick story is welcome. Patreon and Donut Money Donor Time. Patreon and Donut Money Donors. Patreonic. I need to do like a, an intro for Patreon. Patreon, Patreon, Patreon. Pa Patreon. Patreon. Ba, ba, ba. <laughs> uh, we had Tori D already. And again, thank you, Tori, I hope she, for no, being I, a I, member I, of the I Green I feel Party. really like, I, I hope that she likes the new her, job again. Her right? new job. Well, maybe she had a career before that volcanologist oh really she was yep. into volcanoes yep wow 
Wow. So hopefully she's still listening and realizes, wait, I get two jobs. She does. So she's a volcanologist by tr by trade. Profession. And uh, she is. And now retired. And became a Green Party can politician. Can you have a job and be a politician? I don't think so. I, I don't think you can have a job and be a member of parliament. You can have a job, obviously, and be uh, a local politician because you'd starve to death probably yeah. on a mayor's salary or a, a, a council member's salary. I don't know. Maybe I should be a council member. Oh, find God, out. help us. What? what? <laughs> anyway, so... First up, we have Karen Parnum from Airdrie, Alberta. Hello, Airdrie. Karen. Thank you. Yes, thank you. And what does Karen do there in Parnum or in Airdrie? In, in Airdrie, she yeah. she runs the Nose Creek Museum. What is that? It's a museum about runny noses. Are you kidding? Is that a real thing? There is a Nose Creek Museum. Okay, but, but it is not. I doubt that it's not a museum <laughs> dedicated to runny noses. <laughs> runny noses. I kind of have like you a bit of a me. stuffed believe, up nose. You believe me there for a second? No, I really didn't. It's called acting. <laughs> acting. <laughs> just hands. Mike just did just hands just, on that. Just acting. It's acting. <laughs> anyway, so she runs the runny nose. <laughs> the Nose Creek Museum. <laughs> okay. Well, good for her. I mean, someone's got to do it. Yeah. Yeah. Well, there you go. Well, thank you, Karen. Thanks, Karen. Next, we have Linda Watson, and she's from Charing Cross, Ontario. Charing Cross, Ontario. Yeah. Near Chatham. Near Chatham. Interesting. Yeah. So she is the announcer. Okay. In the bull pit, the bull machine in a Texas barbecue there in uh, Charing Cross. Really? Yeah, there's a Texas barbecue restaurant. They have like a bull pit, and she does a, and he's gone. Blah, 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 you know? Okay. Doing, doing the sort of, uh, what do you call that? Sport, sport, like she's a commentator. Bull, bull ride commentator. Okay. Yeah. Interesting. So she's, yeah. Wow. Yeah. He held on for eight seconds. Ain't that great? Yeah. That's, that's, <laughs> so that's, it's stuff like that. that. That's what she does. Oh, well, there you go. Oh, illegal move. He oh, yeah. tied his hand to the thing. Oh, and he's dead. <laughs> that man is lying there. He, it looks like, oh, the bull. Oh, the, a horn should not go there. And she makes sure they don't hold their beer while they're doing it. There you go. Uh, next, we have somebody who says they didn't get a shout out. And her name is oh. Alexandra, formerly Alexandra Thibodeau. And now uh, Alexandra Segewis. She got married in August, apparently. So congratulations on your Congrats. marriage. Congrats. And she says that she became a patron on July 1st of 2002. So Canada, 2022. So Canada oh, Day. We're sorry we didn't catch that. Yeah, I think we've said stuff about you. I can't remember. I really. Who knows? I, it doesn't matter. Doesn't he, matter. Here she is a guest. She didn't hear it. We're happy to have her. Yeah, exactly. In. Um, so Alexandra is famous. Yep. When she was younger, she was one of Leonard Cohen's lovers. Oh, where's she from? Um, she's from Los, Los Angeles. Okay, there you go. And um, he wrote the song Alexandra Leaving Oh, um, about his relationship with her. And what does she do for a living? Well, she's a backup vocalist. Oh, so she's kind of like... Uh... She's like... like you know the Shoop Shoop song by Cher? Uh, gotcha. She does the Shoop. She's actually on that album. Oh, she's a Shoop Shooper. Yep. Shoop Shooper. Okay, there you go. Well, Alexandra, being a Shoop Shooper from Los Angeles, former lover of Leonard Cohen, the great Canadian poet. Yeah. Fantastic. Yep. That's nice. I know. She sounds like an interesting person. She does. Life. Yeah. She says she's been an avid listener since 2019, wow. and she wears her dark poutine Gear with pride. Nice. I'm wearing my dark poutine hat right now. Oh, you are? Yeah, of course I And am. you're wearing a CBC t-shirt. <laughs> my Canadian Broadcasting Corporation, while I still can, before they get defunded after the conservatives take over. Do you think we could get like a one hour show on the CBC, the two of us? I don't know. I have, they have played my show, this sh they have played this show on. Any C CBC producers out there, we would be awesome. Yeah. Just so you know. And we're both handsome, and so you can put us on television. Yeah, we don't even have to call it Dark Poutine. We can just call it Mike and Matthew Blather. It's the Mikey and Matthew show. Yeah. Yeah. They, they fight. They fight. 
<laughs> they fight, they fight, they fight. We don't fight, though. We don't. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, uh, thank you, folks. Thanks to all our patrons and Donut Money donors, past and present, for your generosity. It helps to keep the show going. You can become a patron of Dark Poutine at patreon.com slash darkpoutine. For a one-time donation, you can send us donut money via PayPal using our email address, darkpoutinepodcast at gmail.com. If you don't already subscribe to the show, it would mean a lot if you did. You can easily find Dark Poutine on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you listen to your favorite shows. If you haven't gotten yours yet, my book, Murder, Madness, and Mayhem, is available to order via a link on the Dark Poutine website. And speaking of darkpoutine.com, please check it out for show notes and other cool stuff. We'd appreciate it if you took the time to give Dark Poutine a like or a follow on Facebook and Instagram. Most importantly, thank you for listening. And tell your friends about us. Word of mouth is a powerful thing. Wow. We've done another episode. So, we have. Yeah. So, good na- goodbye and good night. <laughs> <laughs> Until next time, don't forget to be a good egg and a- not a bad apple. And don't be a cracked egg. Don't be a cracked egg. Well, you can be a bit cracked. Okay. Because cause if you're cracked, you're not bad. True. Yeah. The eggs in my refrigerator are probably bad because they're mid-February. <laughs> I just haven't <laughs> gotten around to throwing them out. They last way longer than what's printed on the box. Of there, course they there, do. There's a hint there. Okay. I had two eggs this morning for breakfast. There you go. Okay, love you folks. Hi, it's Shauna, and I might be a bad parent because my kids think french fries are vegetables. Hey, it's Ryan, and I might be a bad parent because I went out for wings when my wife was in the hospital after giving birth. Johnny here. I might be a bad parent because in my house, the tooth fairy gives pocket change. But we're not alone. Len emailed us and said his six-year-old daughter's Tarzan moment going from love seat to lazy boy by curtains made him more proud than any dance <laughs> recital. <laughs> and Andy left his two-year-old at the rink. All right, guys, I'm sure we're not alone. Like Andy's kid. For stories and confessions like this, make sure you check out our podcast. It's called Bad Parents, and it's available wherever you get your podcasts. I left a glove at the rink.